All right, damn it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Red Tool House. Today, we are not at Red Tool House. We are just over the mountain at my buddy Chad's house checking out his pretty cool sugar shack. Morning, Chad. Morning. How are you? Do well, man. Appreciate you letting us come over here and check everything out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for coming over. All right. Well, give us a little detail about where we are here, with the name of your farm and what we've got going on behind us. The farm is, uh, we, we finally came up with the name. We was going to do Trent Family Farm and we opted to go a different route. We needed something a little catchier. We really liked Red Tool House and it was already taken. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, needless to say, needless to say, uh, we decided to do something along the lines and we tried to find something unique about the farm. So we've got two parcels here and we ended up doing Hill and Hollow uh, as the name of the farm. So Hill and Hollow, Family Farm and Sugar Works. Uh, and it actually attributes the two sides of the property. One piece is a direct hill, one is a pretty unique hollow. So awesome. that's kind of what led us that direction. Yeah, I was looking on the map. I believe it may be quicker for me to get here coming on the Straight back side across. of my ridge and get to you than it is to come around on the county road. Straight across, yeah. exactly right. Very cool. It's, new, it's beauty of West Virginia. There's no straight path to get anywhere, is there? You're exactly right. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're standing in front of your sugar shack. Give us a little detail about what you built and, and kind of why you wanted to go maple syrup direction. So a little bit about the maple syrup uh, direction was obviously I'm not a full-time farmer. Uh, so needless to say, I travel for work and I wanted it to be a viable farm, but I didn't want to have to run cattle. I didn't want my wife with three kids out chasing cows at two o'clock in the morning and all that. So uh, needless to say, I've attended several of the agriculture meetings and I ran into a gentleman named Paul Ronk. He was the original and prior to myself, the only producer of maple syrup in the county, or Lincoln County. Uh, so he kind of took me under his wing, uh, showed me the ropes. I helped him with his season last year as well as had a small production season for us. And uh, so that kind of started the whole maple syrup thing. Uh, last year we boiled, uh, or we, we tapped probably 40 or 50 trees in wine bags. Okay. And uh, needless to say, we did it cooktop or uh, with a turkey deep fryer. Uh, so I wanted to do a little bit more, a little bit faster. And I think I may have spent in what used to be, this location right here used to be the old tobacco stripping barn. Okay. Yeah. It was an old grungy building and it, you know, it had served its purpose, but I knew that I wanted something else there. And uh, so I boiled there and I spent 12 hours one day on a Saturday and said, mm, there's got to be a faster way. So over the summer, my wife and I talked about it and we uh, were doing some other construction. We had a little mini excavator here on the property. I'm like, well, let's go ahead and tear that thing down. And she didn't really know what we were getting into at that point. And about October, we started framing. Uh, decided I wanted enough space to be able to put a kitchen into it. So that way we could do the bottling and if she wanted to do canning and some other things that we've got going on here at the farm. Uh, so I wanted it to be big enough but I wanted it to be kind of a, a unique building as well. Uh, so the cupola kind of, people see that and they say, what's the purpose of that? And you know, the fact that it's, you know, not just your traditional, like the old tobacco stripping barn, straight building, just very basic. Uh, but anyhow, it's a 24 by 32 uh, building, minus the eight by 16 uh, pad that we'll eventually have a porch on. Yeah. And uh, the front part is currently being used as a uh, temporary wood shop, whereas the evaporator and the, the maple syrup production is in the back half of it. Yeah. So. Okay, cool. So looking at this, uh, Chad milled his own lumber utilizing a Norwood HD 36. So right. we'll, we'll probably come back at some other time and we'll talk to him about his, his 36 and get some details on that. But uh, it's really cool to see you milled your own stuff, built your own poured a new pad, right? You added some additional Correct. concrete. Yeah. yeah, we did that. Uh, when I bought the farm, the first thing that I bought was the sawmill. Uh, and I got to thinking, you know, if I go out here and I mill up all this stuff, I love to woodwork, it, but if I go and mill all this stuff up, you know, I'm not gonna have any more trees. So uh, I started looking at the farm and I'm like, well, I can cut this and I can cut this. Well, come to find out the ash was the dominant tree that was already standing and dead. So I'm like, I want to make that thing out of standing dead ash. And it had already been standing a couple of years. So uh, the, 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 the branches were off of it. It's basically just a big popsicle stick sticking up out in the woods. Yeah. And you know, a hazard, honestly. I was kind of sketched out when I was, you know, cutting them and dropping them. But uh, anyhow, made beautiful wood and uh, I was glad to be able to use it and not have to cut up, you know, some of the oaks and some of the other trees. Yeah. So. You know, it's interesting, <clears throat> 50 years from now, when, when your kids, your grandkids are looking at this, 
This is going to be looked at like one of the barns that we run into every once in a while where it's the old chestnut. Right. And be like, oh, wow, that's ash. That's so valuable because the, there's no ash trees anymore since the right. ash borer's wearing them out. But yeah, yeah that's, that's really cool. Okay, so we're inside the sugar shack here, which Chad said was part wood shop, which is behind the camera. We'll show that here in a second. But this is kind of where the, the magic happens, right? That's right. So basically what happens is, you know, as opposed to what we did last year with the, the bagging system, we wanted to simplify the process and not be slipping and sliding on those stall days, which is the sap days or the sap collection days. So we did a tubing system off the hill. Uh, that allows the sap to come into a collection tank. I can look out and assess, say, hey, I've got enough to fire up the evaporator. And then we hit a valve and it ends up dumping into the tank and the, uh, the overhead here. And then that allows me to uh, start to feed the evaporator so we can fire it up at that point. Okay. So this really big shiny machine right here, of course, is the evaporator. If you don't mind, give us some details of what happens here. Yeah, absolutely. So the sap comes out of the, uh, the head tank, comes across here to the shutoff, typically connected, but due to the freezing temperatures, I decided to let it drain last night. Sure. Uh, over on this side is actually the, what they call the float box. So that actually regulates the amount of sap coming into the evaporator. And then I've got a glass uh, visual here that shows me, you know, am I running low, am I running high? That way I don't have to, you know, dip a thermometer or the finger in 200 degrees <laughs> water. <laughs> so <laughs> needless to say, uh, this is where the majority of the evaporation takes place. Uh, this is what they call a drop flue pan. They make a raised flue pan and you know the drop flues are designed or the flues are designed to essentially just increase surface area. So by increasing the surface area you increase the amount of evaporation if you have the proper heat. And then as the evaporation takes place, goes out the cupola, uh, the steam, uh, it actually starts to thicken up. So that thickening is the sugar content getting higher. Coming out of this tube, the sugar content's anywhere from a percent and a half to two and a half percent, depending on, you know, a lot of variables there, uh, but comes into the drop flue pan, boils off, and then as it gets thicker, it kind of pushes forward. So it's taking that less, uh, uh, I guess, the, 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 it's traveling the, the path of least resistance. Okay. So it's pushing it forward. Is there a slope here? Uh, that, Not so much okay. a slope, yeah. So what I'll do is once I get a good boil, mm -hmm. I'll actually come over here and we'll crack the valve. That way it starts to flow in this direction. Okay. And then naturally the sugar, the higher sugar content versus the sap starts to push it forward. I see. So that starts to flow. Okay. Typically the first bucket I'll just dump back in. Yeah. And then it'll work its way through the gradient once again. Okay. So uh, that's the component of it. A lot of different factors. You know, me being you know, this, this being my first year running the evaporator, I wanted to make sure I could measure the variables. So uh, we've got a, the ability to check the stack temperature. Uh, I've got a temperature or thermometer right here coming in from this pan to this pan. And then I have one here at draw off. Okay. We can explain those as well. Yeah. So, uh, so obviously natural flow, like you said, so the sap um, from the trees is here. And as you work your way this way, then it's maple syrup. And then at this point, that's where the maple syrup would come out after you've done maybe Correct. a couple rotations. Yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, what they've recommended, you know, these are the people who have been doing this much longer than myself. Uh, what they had recommended is that I pull off just prior to maple syrup mm -hmm. and finish in a more controlled Good. setting. Yeah. So we'll take it over in a big stainless pot, finish it to the, uh, the proper temperature, uh, and then take it to filtration and boiling, from, or yeah. not boiling, bottling from that point. Yes, yeah. hence the reason you have a... Got a little bit of a setup yeah, so far. Yeah, residential looking stove over there because that's where you're going to finish off. That's where yeah. we'll finish, yeah. yeah. So tell me about this. I know most people don't fire with gas. Most people fire with wood. So what is this big monstrosity? So this big monstrosity uh, was a little tinkering uh, based on some other things that I had seen. This is a commercial boiler gas gun. So what it's doing is taking natural gas. Uh, it's kind of like a turbo. So it takes the gas in. You've got ignition and then you've got the air. Uh, so it's just shooting a flame back into there uh, that obviously starts, starts to boil faster, speeds up the evaporation rate. So there's a lot of advantages to it. Uh, not everybody has the luxury of gas or uh, having gas wells on their property. So a lot of people will go the route, the traditional route of the, smoke, or the, the wood fire, uh, as well as some guys are using oil. So. Yeah, yeah. That looks like it had a little bit of engineering associated with it. <laughs> a little bit of engineering. When, when they sent it, you know, I talked to the guys at Carlin, that's the manufacturer, not giving them a plug, but needless to say, they sent a rail, they send it, you know, how the guys that do HVAC that do these commercial boil jobs. And so a lot of this was already there, but the problem was is it was designed to come out and go this way. And as you can see right here, 
it just didn't make sense. Yeah. So I started looking at it. I talked to some buddies, and needless to say, we came up with this setup. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it works. works. Yeah, I noticed you posted a video on your Facebook page, and we'll we'll link everything below uh, to Chad's Facebook page so you can check it out and watch as he gets into the season. But you posted a video the other day, and I think your stack temperature, was I looking at it right? You are about 800? Running, yeah, the first boil. So I did two boils yesterday, uh, just regular water. Uh, first one was anywhere, it fluctuated from 800 to 1,000. I ended up tinkering with the chimney cap a little bit, closing it down, which held some more heat into the evaporator. So, of course, you would see the, uh, the, the uh, stack temperature go up. You know, I was talking about the different variables. I was watching this. So we know that water based on barometric pressure, it changes every day of what it will actually boil at. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was watching this. It was running 210, 211. And then at that point, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't set this thermometer. This is the actual thermometer that tells me, hey, you've got maple syrup you need to draw off. Yeah. So essentially what I do is on a daily basis, I'll take this thermometer out. I'll take it over there. I'll boil water as soon as I see the first good boil. I'll zero that out. Oh, okay. Seven yeah. degrees above boiling temperature of water, we have maple syrup. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, there's right. a lot of different variables to watch. Okay. You talked about the cupola design, and, and there is actually some specific reasoning to, to build your sugar shack this way, correct? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, when this thing's going, and if you look at the videos, this thing's putting a lot of steam out. And, you know, the whole uh, loft area of this, this sugar shack is covered in steam. What the, uh, the cupola actually allows is it's not only for looks. A lot of people think it's just for looks, but it actually opens up the steam naturally vents out of it. Sure. So okay. I kept mine simple. I'm not an engineer by any means, and a lot of guys like pulleys and things like that. But mine's very basic. I just hit it like that, and it opens it up. And then when I'm ready to close it at the end of the day, uh, I'll actually reach up there and grab it with the hook and just pull it back. So no pulleys to freeze, no pulleys to freeze up, and uh, it allows it to, uh, to function properly. All right, so Chad, you're telling me you kind of have, um, you're not tapping two by sixes here. You're actually, this is set up as a demo. So explain this if you would. Well, the, uh, what we call the anchor tree, so the last tree on my uh, main line, so the line that I talked about coming out of the sugar bush, is about a thousand feet away. So when we have people come in, when we're boiling sap and we have the maple days, things like that, uh, actually this will allow me to explain what's going on up in the uh, up in the woods. Oh, so essentially what I- people from walking all over the place. <laughs> yeah, a thousand feet up the hill, I don't want them slipping and sliding and saying, hey Chad, you yeah. know, so uh, needless like to say, uh, this was a, uh, kind of a, a useless space. So I'm like, well, let's set up a little demo area. And essentially what I've got here, uh, this is the main line that comes off the hill. We use a three quarter inch main line. Uh, uh, and then what you've got is the taps or the spiles, uh, essentially. Uh, so I've got a couple of them up here, for example, uh, going into the two by six. They come down to what we call a T, and then it comes back into the saddle. So the unique thing is, is you know, through all the years of uh, sugaring, you know, we started out with the traditional bucket. That collection method, you know, is still used widely, but this allows the sap basically to come into my tank without me having to go collect. Uh, so they've gotten into the tubing, you know, and one of the things that we started last year based on some pretty solid research was uh, 516th was the go-to tubing before in, you know, some of the flatter, so the northeast where these guys have been doing maple syrup for many years, uh, but they also have pumps that basically draw, so it's flat land, there's no gravity. Uh, in a gravity feed situation, which is what we've got, West Virginia and its mountains, uh, they found that the 316 so being a smaller tubing, actually draws a natural vacuum. So you're filling the tube up, once it starts going down, hitting the main line, it's actually helping to pull and suck the sap out of the other trees. Yeah, so you're like siphoning the trees out. It's just siphoning the trees, you're exactly right. Awesome. Yeah. So what we got laid out on this really cool ash log here, man, that was fun milling, wasn't it? So yeah, that was, uh, that was left over from the sugar shack, and I'm like, well, that's kind of an odd shape. Uh, I had a little bit of a saddle, so we're eventually going to make a bench for, uh, for outside. But anyhow, I put a few of the things that uh, are pertinent to uh, maple syrup. Mm -hmm. And the first thing was the tubing. So this is a thousand foot roll of the 316th tubing. Uh, that's basically what you're making, and we'll go through it later on, uh, the drops and what we call lateral. So we'll talk about some of that terminology. That's basically the tubing that's going from tap or spile to spile to spile, connecting it into the main line. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, so, so that's the 3 16th tubing. So this is food grade and UV resistant. Will this stay up the entire time? That is intended. So you put it up, you put a lot of tension on it, it's guaranteed for 10 years. Awesome. So <laughs> one thing that we do change is the drop leads. And the drop leads is basically the piece that goes uh, from the spout uh, or the spile mm -hmm. down to the T, which is into the lateral line. Uh, so we'll change that out on an annual basis. The reason being is, you know, just like when you get a cut or a scratch, Mother Nature kicks in and a scab appears. So we go and drill a hole into a tree. Well, it naturally wants to heal itself. And, you know, there's other factors in there such as bacteria and all that. So it starts to close up the hole. Uh, so you've got to go and basically change that out just for the bacteria concerns on an annual basis. Okay. Uh, we had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the old, uh, the old mechanism here of using the galvanized buckets. My first year was last year and I wanted to do it as economically as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used these things. These are actual, uh, like a double layered wine bag. Yeah. And uh, it was fun. Uh, you know, as, as we mentioned, uh, you know, the, the collection technique was rather interesting, uh, but, you know, tubing was definitely the next uh, natural progression, so. Yeah, wine bags, so these come empty with no wine in them then, right? Of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> well, I always heard, don't buy wine in a box, I never thought about buying wine in a bag. <laughs> right, right, well, that's the logic that's in that box. Gotcha. So, so needless to say, you can get those fairly cheap. Uh, <laughs> we get them from another producer, you know, their land is north of here, and uh, they do a lot of flat land, uh, so they didn't want to do the the uh, the pumps and things like that. So they collect so the wine bags. bags yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So, all right, what do we get here? Next piece. Uh, so when the uh, agriculture department decided they wanted to do the the maple training, uh, they sent us through grading. They sent us through tasting. What gives the different flavors? You know, all the different things that was factored into it. And this is one of the tools that we actually use to show you know the differences in the grades. Uh, so when you you boil, you never really know what you're going to get. You know, sanitation, uh, sugar content, time of the year. A lot of different things factor in whether it's a light maple syrup that's coming out or whether it's a dark and this tool allows us to do this so essentially what I'll do and I've got a collection of these is every time we boil we'll go and collect the first little bit in here and then we can actually go and compare it versus the other collars you yeah. know and if you want to get into grading that's that's basically the tool that allows you to yeah. do so make sure I'm understanding this is 2018's run for you from your farm or this is something else kind of like a this is a standard from Vermont standard, so okay. yeah the, the standard from Vermont there's actually a guy that does this uh, and they have to go and standardize it so this set you know if you leave it out in the sun obviously it's going to fade so we have a little protective shield uh, we'll use it a couple years and then after a couple years we'll have to update the the, the standard so this is golden delicate amber rich and dark robust amber rich didn't you date during high school <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, let's get back on task. <laughs> I digress. What do we got here? So the next piece, uh, this is probably one of the most important things. Whether you're doing large scale, whether you're doing small scale, this is the one tool that you want. And that's a hydrometer cup with a hydrometer. And now I've got two different types of hydrometers here. One of them basically tells me what the sugar content is of the sap, so when it comes out of the tree. And like I mentioned, uh, percent and a half to two and a half percent if we're lucky. Uh, of water volume, so sugar to water volume. And then the other one is when I'm drawing it out of the evaporator, this tells me that I actually have maple syrup. So the gradient, the thickness of it, this will float in a particular range. Yeah. And as long as it's within that range, you have maple syrup. If you underdo it, you have concerns for, you know, it's obviously not going to be thick. You have concerns for things such as mold and, you know, the sanitation component of it. Uh, but that's a nice little tool there. Yeah, uh, very similar to those of us that make adult beverages kind of have the same type of tool there. Yeah. Exactly, oh, yeah, cool. exactly. Gotcha. And then, you know, you have the ability to go and uh, to, to bottle in a lot of things. You know, uh, last year we did mason jars. And well, we wanted to step up our game a little bit. We wanted to have some nice options. We want to be able to show the color and the quality that we're putting out. Mm -hmm. And then we wanted the, the more economical piece to show that, you know, this is, in fact, West Virginia maple syrup. Yeah. All right, Chad, so this, uh, you're telling me, is, is kind of your finishing off. Explain what you've got going on here. So this is the first, uh, the first phase of it. Uh, eventually, you know, stainless everything, but obviously we put some, some money into the evaporator. But basically what happens is uh, when we draw off, whether we're drawing off at maple syrup, so at that seven degree above boiling temperature water or if we're going to actually finish on the stove uh, we'll take it from the evaporator over to this tank before we do that tank we'll actually use what they call an Orlon filter and this filter I've got it folded kind of funky but the reason being is the surface area so it allows me to get more time out of this before the sugar crystals build up hmm. 
Uh, there's actually a pre-filter that goes in there, so if this thing clogs up, I can pull this pre-filter out, put a new one in, and that allows me to continue with this filter. Where does that hang? Is that hanging in this pot? That'll hang over oh, okay. this. So yeah. I've got a little bit of a rack that'll hang over this. Yeah, okay. Uh, so needless to say, we'll filter into that. That way it's nice and clear and clean, and then we can grade it out. No, uh, no nothing basically uh, that could possibly get into it. Uh, you want to bottle at a higher temperature for a couple of reasons. Is you know you buy your bottles in bulk. Uh, it does a sanitation basically, so they come clean from the manufacturer. But you want to go ahead and make sure that it heats it up to where if there is anything that could have potentially gotten in there, it cleans that as well. Uh, so we'll go from there. So filter into here heat it or finish it so if we're going to finish it off to maple syrup and then if it's something to where i can't finish it that day if we've got the evaporator crank and we've got a lot of sap what i'll typically do is transition it into the coffee urn the coffee urn keeps it at a right temperature to where it's still able to go through if we wanted to filter again and or if we wanted that sanitation component of bottling oh, okay so yeah we can bottle from either option very good so that kind of keeps it at a stasis point then correct yeah. all right because yeah. we'll be draw drawing off uh you know Anywhere from a, you know, a gallon, two gallons at most any given time. So come over, dump it in through the filter. And then, like I said, if it's going to be a long time before I want to get the bottle in, I'm going to keep it warm. Yeah. You cool it down, you heat it up. One thing happens with maple syrup is the, the uh, sugars start to crystallize. And then you've got to filter again. Otherwise, you get a little grittiness in the, the maple syrup itself. So. Well, what about your distribution and sales? What's your, what's your game plan this year for, <laughs> for that? Distribution and sales. So uh, I really don't have a huge game plan, a lot of word of mouth. I can mm -hmm. tell you that a lot of people just merely by having the, uh, the Facebook page has uh, reached out. You know, family have shared, friends have shared. And, you know, I've got people in Texas and Louisiana and several places I never imagined I'd be sending West Virginia maple syrup to. So uh, that's kind of the intentions. Uh, luckily, the state pro or the uh, agriculture uh, program has been very passionate about the maple syrup component. We're one of the last states to, I hate to say get into it, but to get into it at the scale that we are. We're kind of at that southern line to where that freeze-thaw cycle, you know, produces. Uh, so they put a lot of money in regards to advertising for us. We've got things such as Maple Days coming up. They had the Veterans to Agriculture program that went through training with the people from Vermont on you know the, the process of uh, sugar making as well as testing, grading, and all that. So the state you know sees it as a uh, untapped potential. Uh, no pun there. But <laughs> if you if you look at uh, if you look at the numbers, we actually have more tappable maples in the state of West Virginia than all of Vermont. There you go. Yep. So. Another another great. Another great untapped secret of West Virginia. That's exactly yep. right. Love it. So Chad, you mentioned something about Maple Days. What is that and, and, and what, what do you got going on here on the farm? So yeah, Maple Days uh, essentially is something that the, uh, the, the uh, agriculture program uh, has put out there for us. Uh, we wanted it to be in the, the season. And in order to get it into the season, we wanted to be boiling and have you know the, the, the full effect of the sugar shack. Invite people out, anybody can come. Uh, that day we'll do tours and demos of the sugar shack, the collection process, you know, just trying to create awareness not only about West Virginia maple syrup, but the fact that anybody can do this, you know, whether it's large scale, small scale, or whatever. Uh, so this year, uh, it'll be February and March. There's two days that uh, we'll, uh, yeah, I'll we'll post, get to. post those below here. Yeah. Yep, and uh, then, you know, any of the sugar shacks uh, throughout the state that are participating, they'll, uh, they'll actually have links to where you can get there. Uh, there'll be taste testing, so a lot of different things. Cool. So if Kelly and I ride over on the side by side with some waffles, then we can we can set it up on that day, I guess. Come a little early because I want some waffles too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. All right. All right. Well, Chad, man, I really appreciate the time. Appreciate the tour. This is awesome. Um, those of you watching, we're going to actually hit the hill next, but I think we're going to make that another video because I don't want uh, I don't want this video to be over an hour long. Chad's really giving some great stuff, so I want to make sure I don't have to cut anything out. And you all can uh, stick with us here, but we'll do a part two on this. But appreciate your time, Chad. Absolutely. I appreciate Enjoy you it. coming out. Thank right, you.